that will be uh, recorded. Okay, so I would like to welcome everybody to the 11th webinar of this series of webinars for the CFTC internship program. Today we'll have Pedro Ferreira. Pedro is a professor at ISL and researcher here at CFTC. Is the ideal person to tell you the story of the ant for the X boson and the contribution from theory. So thank you, Pedro, for accepting to talk, and the internet is yours. Mute. Okay, thank you, Cristóvão. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to come and talk to you. And uh, this seminar will be talking, will be uh, about the Higgs and how we theoreticians hunt the Higgs with the help of our experimental friends. So, uh, the Higgs boson is the latest elementary particle that was discovered in 2012 and it has a role rather different from the other elementary particles that we know. However, the Higgs boson, even though it does a lot, there's quite a number of open questions that it does not answer, which means that we go beyond the standard model of particle physics by considering theories which have uh, more than one Higgs boson. And these uh, extensions try to answer questions such as the origin of mass, okay, that's what the Higgs boson does, that's done. The nature of dark matter, you might recall a couple of seminars ago, Professor Huysen spoke about that, and the fact that uh, the universe is mostly composed of matter and not antimatter. And before we continue, some people refer to the Higgs boson by a horrible expression, the God particle. And I make mine the words of the great Samuel L. Jackson, do not use that expression if you value your lives. Now, if we're talking about elementary particles, all matter is composed of fermions. Here in this scheme, we see in green, the fermions which are more common in the universe. You see there, for instance, the electron. You see two quarks up here, the U and D quark, which are the components of protons and neutrons. And you also see neutrinos in green. But then we have three copies, progressively uh, more heavy, but copies in terms of quantum numbers, of these particles. And no one knows why we have three copies and why they are more heavy one than the other. Now, these fermions uh, obeying um, equals a half, they interact among themselves through four interactions, four forces. And these four forces are mediated by particles. Not only matter is composed of particles, the interactions are also composed or transmitted by particles which are called gauge bosons. And here is the word boson. So these gauge bosons are particles with spin equals one. And these Four forces are gravity, uh, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, which is responsible, for instance, for the production of energy in nuclear reactors, and the weak nuclear force, which is responsible for certain types of radioactivity. Now, the thing is, that uh, these particles, uh, all of the particles that compose matter and all of the particles that compose interactions are not the whole story. We need something else, a single particle so far, which is the Higgs boson. And we need the Higgs boson, as you see here, because all of these particles that have mass, except for instance, the photon and the gluon, they derive their mass from the Higgs boson. So that's why we need the Higgs boson, which is an elementary scalar, meaning a particle that has spin zero. So quartz and leptons have spin a half, the gauge bosons have spin one, and the Higgs boson is a single spin zero particle that has been discovered so far. And before we go to two Higgses and more than one Higgses, uh, what is the Higgs boson? How does it work and why do we need it? I've already answered a couple of these questions, but these obey the fundamental part physical, uh, the fundamental principle of particle physics. When you have a problem you cannot solve, 
nine times out of 10, you just invent a new particle. It worked with antimatter, it worked with the neutrinos, and it worked with the Higgs boson. And the problem here is that the standard model is a theory, an extremely well successful theory, based on the idea of symmetry. Symmetries are what control these interactions among particles. And when you add up matter interactions and symmetry, then the theory forces all of the masses in the model to be exactly equal to zero. So the electron, for instance, in this version, we introduce a new particle, and we've done it in 1964, that's the, the theory of the Higgs boson. Almost 50 years after that theory was proposed, the Higgs boson was discovered. And it is through the interaction of the matter and interaction particles with the Higgs boson that they gain a mass. So what is the Higgs? Well, it is the particle that gives elementary particles their mass. Notice how I'm saying elementary particles. We are actually not talking about the origin of the larger uh, quantity of mass in the universe. That's a separate issue. If you want, you can ask me about that later. And the Higgs, through its interactions with the different particles, gives them their masses. Mr. Higgs uh, is shown here. He is uh, Scottish. And he won the Nobel Prize in 2013 because after more than 50 years, his um, theory came to fruition and was confirmed. And Higgs particle and the internet, you will find pictures like this. And uh, they concern a mathematical function called the potential. The Higgs potential is what governs um, something called spontaneous symmetry breaking, which I will now briefly discuss. And the Higgs potential is also called the Mexican hat potential because if you see here, it has kind of a central shape going up and then it's round all over and goes up exactly. How does the Higgs boson give particles their masses? Well, the whole issue is that you need these symmetries to control the interactions and to make sure that the theory is um, complete, well behaved, and has a great predictive power. But as long as these symmetries are intact, then you do not have masses. And so the solution ends up being very simple. You do an exchange. You have the symmetries in the theory, but the theory is unstable. And you let the symmetries break themselves. Spontaneously, the symmetries, the system is such that kind of dynamically, spontaneously, the systems, the symmetries break themselves. It's a very, very neat and beautiful mechanism that has uh, been extremely successful in explaining why the electron, the quarks, and the gauge bosons have the masses. Um, and it works. acquire mass. The, the theory is so beautiful and so well constructed that stuff that doesn't have mass, like the photons and the gluons, well, within the Higgs mechanism, they remain massless. And the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking is very simple. If you have, for instance, a pencil lying vertically, well, the pencil is symmetric or it has a symmetry because there is no preferred direction upon which the pencil will fall. You have 360 degrees to choose. The pencil might sometimes fall to 37 degrees or 214 or 0 0.2. There is no preferred direction. When it is vertical, the pencil has a symmetry around it concerning the direction upon which it will fall. But if you drop the, if you let go of the pencil, well, the pencil is unstable and it will spontaneously choose one direction in particular, in this case, this angle here. But it might have fallen to another direction completely because there were no preferred directions. So the system exchanged symmetry by stability. And it is something similar which occurs with the Higgs boson. You start with a symmetric state and naturally the system evolves to a non-symmetric state. But you start it from symmetry and that's all you need. This transition, uh, one 
we call electroweak phase transition, we believe occurred in a fraction of second after the Big Bang. And this essentially means, in terms of mass, that you go from a symmetry state where there is no uh, inertia for the particles, as if you are throwing a ball in an empty swimming pool, to if the pool is full of water, the same ball thrown with the same strength will find inertia along the way. Spontaneous symmetry breaking kind of fills the universe with what we call um, a constant density of energy. So, um, in order for this to work, as I said, um, the particle, the Higgs particle must be a scalar, it has a spin zero, and it must be neutral. And this is the standard model. It works like a charm, but there's quite a number of things that it doesn't answer. And how do you give a VEV to a scalar field? It's very simple. It just has two real parameters, mu squared and lambda. It has here a modulus of the field squared and the modulus of the field to the fourth. This number lambda needs to be positive. And if you have mu squared positive, then the minimum is reached when your field is equal to zero. If this parameter mu squared is negative, then the minimum is reached when the field is non-zero. This minimum with a field equals to a non-zero value is the situation of the standard model. So, because we're going to talk about matter and antimatter, it's important to recall that um, what distinguishes matter from antimatter is not simply the change of, uh, of charge, electron going to a positive positron, it's also a flip in parity. A spin up goes to a spin down. For neutrinos in particular, this has um, the distinction between matter and antimatter is actually also a symmetry. It's a symmetry called CP. And um, we know that the universe is essentially made up of matter and not the antimatter. Here we are in the Milky Way. There are our neighbors in Andromeda. And we know that both us and Andromeda and all the galaxies in the universe are made of matter and not antimatter. Because the space between galaxies is not empty. There is gas here. And if our matter found their antimatter, we would see huge explosions of gamma rays coming from the space between galaxies. And we don't see them, neither among our local neighbors as all over the universe. So we know that the universe is mostly made of matter and not antimatter, even though we don't know why. We also know that there seems to be a great quantity of invisible matter, which you call dark matter, and Professor Huysens mentioned it, um, in the universe. And what is it? Nobody knows. Models with uh, extra scalar particles are possibilities to give answers to these questions, such as why does the universe have more matter than antimatter and what is the nature of dark matter? And some of the cool stuff we have been working here in Lisbon in collaboration with other groups from Germany, from Sweden, from Italy, from the United States, um, and many other places. I'm just going to briefly mention a couple of our latest articles in, this, in these areas. So in 2012, we discovered a new Higgs boson. It's fantastic. And the crucial thing is that our experimental colleagues are finding that this particle is very much compatible with the standard model expected behavior for the Higgs boson. But this is boring. So in 1970, model was produced called the two Higgs doublet model um, by T.D. Lee in 1973. And one of the possibilities is precisely it can explain matter-antimatter asymmetry and provide dark matter candidates. And to give you an idea of what the two Higgs doublet model is, remember that the Higgs potential that I showed you was this very simple thing with just one field phi and two free parameters. If you now look at the two Higgs doublet model, it's this much less nice thing, which has, in fact, seemingly 14 independent parameters and two Higgs doublets. The thing is, it's not just complicating stuff. There is quite a number of interesting phenomena that come here. For instance, in the 2HDM, there is a very scary possibility 
that whereas in the standard model, you just have one possible minimum, in the 2HDM, you might have two. And these two minima are completely different or can be completely different. If you are here in the local minimum, this is just one possibility, by the way. There's also the possibility that this guy does not exist or like this above. Here, you have all the elementary particles that you know and love with their correct masses. But eventually, you might tunnel down to the global minimum and we call it, we call it the panic vacuum because then all of the elementary particles would have a different mass. And this transition would be catastrophic and the universe would end and would end in a very cruel way. So this is one of the possibilities that if the parameters of the model produce it, we wish to avoid those parameters. And in a, a recent work with some of my colleagues in uh, Italy, Sicily actually, we studied for very large amounts of parameters, when was this happening? And we found of the model for which uh, these um, deeper minima would indeed be very, very serious and would have to be avoided. So this region of parameter space here in red is definitely to be avoided. It's excluded on physical terms, but there's still quite a large area of parameter space available. It's more complex than this, but this gives you an idea that the model can have very interesting phenomena that uh, you don't want to happen. And that gives you a possibility of restricting some of the values of that complex parameter space. And if you go to even more complicated parameters in which now the next 2HDM is a 2HDM in which you add a new spin zero particle, but it's what's called a singlet. It has no charge, it has no quantum numbers. It's a model that's very interesting for very many different aspects. And again, here you have different aspects of uh, different possibilities of spontaneous breaking. You can have different minima. You could also have, like in the 2HEM, charge breaking minima for which the photon would have a mass. And again, you can study the exclusions of parameter space that might occur from these minima. And you find some interesting things, like, for instance, if you were to have, these are different observables, I don't have the time to explain what they are, but if you were to have, say, regions around here where the red points are, then that would tell you if you measure these things and you are here where these dark red points are, then that would tell you that this next 2HDM model is excluded on experimental grounds. And we theoreticians love producing new models, but we also love excluding them on experimental grounds, or at least limiting their, um, their range of parameters. And you see here that we have a very strong collaboration with our experimental colleagues. And for instance, in 2017, um, ATLAS um, measured or seemed to measure a small excess in a given observable. It was the production of a Z boson on the Higgs um, and the Higgs boson, there's that small kink there that goes beyond the yellow. If anything goes beyond the yellow above, that means there's something else there than the standard model or might No, but we could register it and uh, explain it at least partially in the, in the two Higgs double model. And it's something called the wrong sign. What do you mean the two Higgs double model has the wrong sign? That's a very interesting question and I have less than two minutes, so I cannot answer it. Um, if you want, ask me later. So here you see that um, the colored points with the nice colors are the predictions of the model and the red, uh, the, the, green, the, the black line is where the excess was. And you can almost reach it here and that's um, uh, BB bottom quark production of something at LHC and here is glue glue production. Here you definitely can reach it there. There you can almost go there. So again, a very straight collaboration between experimentalists and theoreticians. And just to finalize, we also did something very nice recently, a model which has explanations for two of the problems I told you. Both CP violation, meaning uh, an explanation for why matter and antimatter have um, such uh, different quantities in our, in our universe, but all, 
but also an explanation for dark matter. All CP violation in this model, and this again, it's a, an X to HDM model, is concentrated on the dark matter sector of the theory. But somehow, and through some weird interactions between the Z bosons, that CP violation in the dark sector comes back to the, um, to the, um, to the visible sector. Uh, and this also allows us to do some interesting calculations uh, for uh, experimental observables, trying to find signals that indeed at LHC you could probe this theory or disprove it. And again, this is um, a different version of the next to HDM model that I uh, that I mentioned earlier. Here you find names of. Uh, three of the collaborators of CFTC, Duarte Zvid, myself, and Professor Huysens, and it all came down from that nice cubic term there. Um, so let's see. I'm about to finish, but fortunately, I'm in my my uh, conclusion. So the Higgs um, sector and extensions of the Higgs sector is an extreme. we are at a stage where um, we are greatly dependent on new results from the Large Hadron Collider. And many people are uh, disappointed by the fact that since the Higgs discovery in 2012, we haven't yet discovered anything else. To which I cannot re reply, the Higgs boson was predicted in 64 and it took almost 50 years to discover. So these things are difficult, okay? Um, and the LH um, constrain and disprove many of the theories that we have been studying for the past 50 years. Um, the greatest challenge in Higgs physics, though, in, as in all models in science, is come up with new and better ideas. I've given you some examples of what people are doing, but, you know, we can never close our minds to completely new ideas, provided, of course, that they are solidly uh, built and um, make sense. But finally, I mean, isn't that what being a scientist is all about? It's just have a theory, compare it with experiment, and be serious about the calculations you do. So thank you very much for your patience. Cristóvão, I kept my time. I yes. did. So thank you. Hello. Thank you, Pedro, for the interesting talk. So we already have a few questions uh, on the Q&A. Okay. okay so the first question from an anonymous, is there any relation between gravitons and the X particle? So can the X particle be a starting point for a quantum theory of gravity? No. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, the exact answer. Um, gravity has absolutely nothing to do with everything that I mentioned so far, and that's a huge problem. When, when I mentioned that um, interactions are mediated by particles gauge bosons, I was going so, so quickly that I didn't have time to say that we know that to be true for the electromagnetic force, for the weak force, and the, from the strong nuclear force. We have quantum theories for these three, but we do not have a quantum theory for gravity, okay? So for gravity, we don't know even whether gravity is transmitted by particles. We don't even know if there's such a thing as quantum gravity, even though we think there is. for instance, have tried to uh, come up with quantum formulations of gravity with varying degrees of success, but such theories are completely unproven. But the Higgs boson, that we know for sure, cannot explain quantum gravity. It can have gravity effects, yes. Uh, the Higgs boson, um, one of the huge problems is that the Higgs boson might be responsible for something called the cosmological constant, but the current uh, observations and the current calculations are not, um, cannot uh, in absolute reproduce the observed value of something that comes in gravity, which is the cosmological constant. Next question. Okay, thank you, Pedro. So the next question is, uh, so there is, the question is, there is an ongoing discussion about how important it is to have new collider. 
Is there anything we can still expect from the existing, existing colliders or they are no longer necessary? If I knew the answer to that question, I would have a Nobel Prize, or at the very least, I would have already decided to switch fields. Um, it's look, um, it's what I said earlier. We, it took us 50 years to find this guy, okay? We had no idea what its mass was. 